Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This thing, the puzzle piece. Can we just put Casey's face in it, though? Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Um, wow, super awesome for now. We're really excited to share some of what we've been up to with Ewasm and, and learn from you guys about. Um, Quick presentation that you gave to DCC about. Maybe we all introduce ourselves yeah. first. But, uh, oh, and by the way, this is being live streamed, so just be aware because it's live on YouTube. I just tweeted the link if anyone wants to share it as well. So, hello world. I'm a core developer on the UWASM team. I'm Everett. I'm also a core developer on the UWASM team, working on specifications and some formal verification stuff. I'm Jake. I work on uh, here at the UWASM VM. Uh, I'm Jared, uh, and I work on EVM to Wasm and Hira as well. I'm Paul, I work on PyWeb Assembly. I'm um, Alex, I'm working on Specs and Hira. Yes. I'm Ziak, I'm working on uh, Box Explorer. We still have Casey on the. Uh, Casey just left it all. But <laughs> <laughs> well, Casey's watching. Oh, okay. Is everyone else introducing themselves? Sorry. Well, I don't know unless everyone else wants to, but it's. Can we actually switch your slide? I think so. Yeah, let me just. Yep. I, I can do it for you, or you can do it yourself if you want. I don't have a picture. Yeah. Right? I'll, I'll just do it for you. I'll do it for you. I guess we should just start with MVP now. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, I guess we, we should just figure out what um, what people here know about the awesome or what did you hear about it, or why why are you interested? Um, so who hasn't heard about the awesome yet? Awesome. 
I haven't. You haven't? I have. Everybody else has seen the ETC presentation? Nobody has no. seen the ETC presentation. Um, <laughs> you want to do that? Why not? Why not? I guess then um, everybody wants to get like a quick intro of why we are working in Wasm and uh, what kind of problems we're trying to solve with that. Is that like a good, good place to start? Yes. Uh, do you want to get some kind of uh, look at the, the past and you know where we started from? Um, I'm gonna, which, this is the one? Yeah. Okay, like, so we're talking about Wasm, that should be clear, which stands for Ethereum Plague with WebAssembly. And that is my name, but that's usually how people know me uh, by the, the nickname on GitHub. Okay, so this was from ETC. Right, <laughs> 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 yeah, not here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like, no, how many of you have like five hours yeah. of uh, box? Yeah. Um, so we have this intro, which this slide's going to be. Um, and we have a lot of other things. I think Jared can do a demo this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have Pavel here, but we do have Jake. So if you want to get like more info about the, the DM called Hera, he might be able to tell you some. Um, and we have Everett, who would be more than happy to talk. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. So if if you look back at script, uh, which could do a couple of different things, but that was quickly restricted because people got afraid that uh, it could be exploited. Um, and because of these restrictions, people started to look at how to uh, circumvent those restrictions. And one of the options were to fork Bitcoin and create another specific chain. The first such chain was Namecoin, if anyone heard of Namecoin. Um, and the, the idea there was to extend This is op return. If anyone, if anybody heard about op return, um, that's another instruction in Bitcoin. Um, basically, stops the transaction and whatever is placed after it is ignored by the VM, so you could put random data there. Uh, and that's how people started to do like um, uh, side chains and anything back to Bitcoin. Um, and then came Ethereum for one of the one of the main reasons there was that why do we have these restricted scripts? Why don't we make a more generic script? a more generic uh, VM, and then we could, um, we wouldn't need to fork uh, blockchains and have multiple blockchains doing a specific thing. We could have a generic one. But then quickly with Ethereum, people ran into issues that, okay, we have the generic VM, which can do a lot of things, but it's kind of slow. And a lot of important parts, what you need in a blockchain would be hashing methods, and like EC Recover is a feature to get the public key out of the signature, and that's really useful to verify signatures. Um, and because people run into the issue that the VM performance enough, we had to subsidize a couple of things. So these features were subsidized, and commonly they can be called as Ethereum precompiles. What a precompile here means is they're not written in VM itself, but every single client has to write it in the language of choosing. Uh, so for example, the GoEthereum client, has all of these features uh, written in Go, and every single client has to do the same. And then hopefully it comes to assembly and we can drop all of these legacy things. We don't need to create precompiles, and we don't need to have this broad VM, this broad client. We can have really slim. Slide because I can complain about EVM. Um, oh, maybe that's the next one. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the EVM is, I think the audience said you know the EVM, right? Or at least you know Solidity and you have faced these issues through Solidity. Have you seen in Solidity this? Um, I think there are like 15 different error messages for it, but too many local variables. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite annoying. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's a stack machine. Each of the stack items are 256 bit wide, which interestingly doesn't really map to any traditional computer. Um, apart from the EVM, there's no traditional computer. 
which operates in 256 bits. Everything would be limited to 364. So this design decision doesn't really seem like a lot of sense. Um, I actually wasn't there when this decision was made, but I think it was made because of the <clears throat> of the fact that all the hashing methods involved would be 256 bit, and then it looked like a good idea. Okay, so the result of the hashing method is going to be 256 bit, so let's just deal with that. Um, but in respect, it seemed like it. Um, it has all the basic instructions you would expect from a virtual machine, but it also has a lot of high level instructions. Uh, which in many machines you wouldn't really put into the CPU. They would be part of a higher level abstraction. But in the EVM, they are put into the CPU. So that's another design decision which kind of looks weird. Um, so these high level methods would be able to crimp the state, interacting with the state. Uh, so these are all the calls and the storage. And then we have this instruction, which is like super high level. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, I think actually, like a funny fact about that one. And I think initially, initially all of them were instructions, but then those were moved out because they would be used less frequently. Chat should remain. Interestingly, this came up just in the last couple of weeks on the EIP processes. Are you familiar with EIPs, Ethereum Improvement Proposals? Um, so there's a proposal uh, to, so whenever you call a pre-compile, you're still charged for the call. And the call has a cost on its own, which is 700 gas. And in many cases, the pre-compile uh, for like SHA-256, I think it's like 32 gas per word, but something really low. But then you have the 700 gas on top of it. And the proposal is to remove this because currently there's no way to pre-compile which would cost less than 700 because you have the cost for the call. Here, it's kind of weird. Why would this be in the CPU? It doesn't actually make sense. fact about the EVM is not many languages are targeting this um, CPU. I think that's kind of changing because there are more and more languages now. Um, but this was really true for the last two years. There was practically two languages, uh, Solidity and Viper uh, slash Serpent. Um, but now I think there are more. But still, it's a brand new CPU. And compiler frameworks have to target it. Um, and because it's so specific, Frameworks were for targeting it, rather languages directly were designed to be operating on the EVM. Um, so these are just kind of some of the, the problems here. Can you expand a bit on why you think 256 bit words is a bad idea? Because from the outside, it doesn't look like it. Just that you have on the EVM, they're going to have to do extra operations on whatever hardware you do to kind of shuffle around, you know, the 64-bit words, 32-bit words. Like EWASM has 64 and 32-bit words, which means that the opcodes can pretty much just call native, be translated almost directly to native opcodes, which means faster execution. Um, I think It operates on public keys and hashes, and you can compare those. And if you look in, in Ethereum that with the same logic, the only thing you're going to do on Ethereum is for transactions and you compare public keys, then having 256 bit stack items makes sense. But if you're doing more generic computation, then usually you're not going to use such large values. You should usually fit into 64 bits. And if you're majority of your code is not really making use of this, then you're wasting a lot of space. Um, and it's not, not only just memory which you're wasting, but rather computation. Because you still have to calculate everything on 256 bits, even though mostly the lower 32 or 64 bits are used. Um, so if, if you look back 
the last three years, what kind of contracts are out there, they don't really make use of this at all. So it's wasteful to do validations on, uh, on that size. Um, I think we talked most about these issues, but yeah, everything in the previous one um, is bad. But some of them are more bad, bad than others. Um, you have to have like a big number library, uh, which is a lot more operations for every single edition, right? Every single like arithmetic instruction, you're doing a lot of extra steps which are not needed. Um, hmm, the entering, I don't remember why I put it there in high related, but yeah. Well, I mean, the same thing you said, like if you're metering based on assuming you can do addition in one step, right? But actually what's happening is you're implementing it using a big number library. That's not actually a realistic, you know, assumption about how people are actually doing the computation, right? Because they have to do. Oh yeah, I remember, I think the point here was that you're charging the user a lot more for work, which you have to actually do, but there's no point doing. Um, and we have the very high level instructions. So the parts I'm personally happy with is having these uh, state querying operations, and especially the And the runtime metering is, is the biggest part, which actually is not just a problem with the EVM, um, it's rather a problem with the clients. So you could you could solve this in EVM. You don't need EWASM to solve it. Um, you could have, say, a special instruction to do to do that class um, in EVM, and you could go through your instructions and calculate how much uh, each of the blocks is going to do in your EVM um, in your EVM contract, and you could just sum them and and make a deduction once. Um, but we don't have that in the EVM, so how it works currently is whenever an interpreter uh, goes through every single instruction in your contract, every single time it has to see how much this instruction is going to cost. And it has to compare it against how much gas we have left. And if there's less gas than what it's going to cost, there's an exception. Um, does this make sense? Everybody is familiar with the meeting, right? Um, so in the next few slides, it's going to be more clear how we could change that. <laughs> so WebAssembly, just quickly, it looks like a regular CPU. It's designed like a regular CPU. Um, we have said so many times it's 64-bit, um, it's limited to 64 bits. Uh, it doesn't have these super high-level instructions. A lot of people were involved in designing it, which includes all the major companies, all the companies behind all the major browsers. Um, like a year ago, there were more than 600 participants signed up to this. So it's a W3C working group. Anybody can sign up. And anybody can voice their ideas or how they would like to change uh, WebAssembly. And they actually have, I think every quarterly, probably, they have a, an open meeting people can join. And you can make a proposal and change the uh, change WebAssembly, the virtual machine itself. Um, and then it's a work which you know, people have the idea of working groups don't work very well. Uh, it has been finalized in this version one. I and this is the major point that because it's designed, so it's kind of confusing that this bad part, right? Um, one would imagine that it's really designed only for web browsers and uh, it couldn't be used for anything else. Um, but luckily, the eWASM project was one of the first ones to identify WebAssembly as, as a good option for a written machine. And uh, like two years ago, when it was still early in the design process of WebAssembly, um, we have looked at it and we raised our concerns with them. Uh, by them, I mean like the working group. Um, and it really seemed like that there's nothing blocking uh, the use of WebAssembly in a blockchain context. Um, so it's not really just designed for the web. It's designed to be a general purpose machine. Um, the, the reason it was designed for the brand in the first place is to have JavaScript um, to do high-level stuff. And if you need like CPU-intensive calculations, you would do that in WebAssembly. Um, and another driving force there is to not invent a new language, which you could use to compile to WebAssembly, 
rather to have all the existing languages and all the existing frameworks and super on the front end that means like the languages it supports all the major languages um, so you, you could say C, C++, uh, port language in order to compile stuff to WebAssembly. So this would open up. Yeah, the there's, a, there's an LLVM to WebAssembly backend as well. Okay. Yeah. Why you brought that up, right? Yeah. So like LLVM is a compiler framework, and the compiler frameworks work like uh, that. You have a front end which uh, deals with the languages, and then you have Anything in the middle which does optimizations, and you have backend which generates bytecode for which machine. <clears throat> and, and the last point about WebAssembly, it was designed uh, to be jitted. It was designed to be um, efficiently executed in current CPUs. And so all the instructions are. Be executed on, on CPUs than EVM because EVM had really different design goals. Um, okay, I changed the design. Um, probably I don't want to go too deep into this, but uh, in a WebAssembly uh, program, so to say, um, you have the instructions and you can import external things. And you can also export your functions. And when you're importing external things, what you're doing in the context of Ethereum, you're importing Ethereum functions. And by Ethereum functions, you can think about storage store, storage load, call, all of these things. So like functions to interact with the storage and functions to interact with other contracts and to interact with the state. So like, like get the balance of a contract, et cetera. So those are the things uh, you're exposing to WebAssembly but we're not changing anything else. Um, yeah, whenever, so we have like this deployment process, whenever you send a contract to the, to the network, it is verified, it is verified before deployment, and then it is deployed, and at runtime, yeah, at runtime, we are doing this metering. Um, that's the most important aspect, I guess, which should be, Coming soon, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's the things I said that. Should we talk about this? No, it, it, it's too confusing, right? Yeah. Um, metering, this we mentioned already. So, like in EVM, currently we have to do everything runtime, and we should change that if it wasn't. Yeah, this probably is a bit too technical, um, but the idea here is. That cost, uh, the next one, etc. And you do this runtime, and you compare that what you have left, and you know if you say after this, this so rather than that, we can break this into like these three different blocks, and we know that the green block is always executed, and these are either what either the blue one or the the red one is executed. So what we can do is sum up all of these individually, how much they're going to cost. And we can insert a single statement in front of them. And those single statements just uh, make single check. Will this execution fit into our limit? That makes sense, but why can you do it in the EVM? Because it's a stack machine. No, you can do it in the EVM, but you would need an instruction like this, specifically in the EVM. And we don't have an instruction like this in the EVM. Yeah, okay, so it's just a chance. Yeah, but we can add such an instruction. And uh, nobody wanted to do it, right? Uh, but you could if you wanted. Um, I think it wasn't going to bring more benefits than just a yeah. single yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, you could do this in VBM as well. Um, but in EWASM, you don't need to, uh, you know, introduce anything new. 
the, the entire concept supports this way of metering. Okay. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I feel like you still need to do the runtime metering, right? Because uh, for certain parts, yeah. But I mean, is there some validation that those checks are enough? Um, like, so apparently you need 13 gas to uh, run the, the condition, right? Yeah. Then the nodes are still going to be uh, metering that to see that it actually costs 13 gas according to the like the yellow paper spec. There's like a deployment time contract that everyone agrees on, basically. It's part of the spec, really, that inserts these metering statements, and everyone agrees on how the metering statements are supposed to be inserted ahead of time. So if you deploy the contract and you inserted the metering statements incorrectly as a malicious miner, other miners would reject okay, correct. your deployed version. Well, if you insert your own metering statements, you're only going to use more gas, more right. your own gas. Yeah. So it's and it will still really. go through the metering process. Yeah, like exactly. if you answer your own metering statements, it will be re-metered before being put on chain. So if you realize that all branches are going to use more more gas than you have, then you don't execute at all. You yeah, it's, it's going to feel like that's all the branches. Yeah. Okay. Until you reach a part that you know all the branches are not possible, so you just break yeah. instead of wasting time, which is what there's now. Yeah, and I mean, that saves a little bit of time because you don't do execution, but really what saves more time is like, here you can look at this block of like and, and, equals Z, equals Z. All of that can be mapped to probably a string of one-to-one -one hardware operators. But if you have to, in between each of those, inject like and deduct the gas, and deduct the gas, and deduct the gas, suddenly you've blown it up by a huge linear factor. You see, so that, that's really where I think the big time savings are. So that, this actually goes back to one of those motivations of understanding that it should really map to uh, the physical CPU and execution shouldn't happen in the fashion of, okay, this is the instruction, what do I do? And this is the instruction, what do I do? Rather, this should be like all of these blocks should be translated into your local CPU's instruction set and it should be executed on your local CPU uh, in like a trusted environment. Um, and if uh, time and effort, which we could just skip, uh, be following um, this this um, ahead of time metering statements because we don't need to do all of those at every single step. Does, does it make sense? Uh, probably this is one of the, the more important aspects we have right now, um, or the more interesting ones. All nodes use normal CPUs today, right? Ethereum nodes, they're all made of normal CPUs. Yeah. No specialized like hardware. So that's why it makes sense to, to use that. Yeah, most of the nodes, um, I guess, really just use x86, which is like the Intel CPUs. Um, but all the light clients, like mobile phones, going to use probably ARM mm -hmm. CPUs. And WebAssembly was specifically because of this this background of the web. And you have mobile phones which use the web, and you have computers which use the web. It was really designed to support and target both CPUs. So it actually matches with what we as Ethereum um, developers want. All of these ideas WebAssembly has really matches what, what we need and want. Um, so that's why it really seems like a good good idea um, to use WebAssembly. So if you want to look a, a bit more into the background decision why we choose WebAssembly over others, uh, on the design repo there's a document explaining and comparing all other, so like the ones we looked into was C-sharp, uh, C-sharp's VM which is CLR, JVM, I don't know, a few others, but it's all listed there. So if you want to learn more about that, it's on the design repo. All right, so the language support, yeah, I mean, you can write it in WebAssembly directly. So those are the statements, but you don't have to. You can use higher level languages, and hopefully you can also use Solidity. Um, so you don't have to learn anything new, and you can get all these benefits. All right, um, yeah. That, that was for anyone who wants to to look more deeply into that assembly. And this is an example in C, if anyone is familiar with C. Okay, so the actual reasons. Um, most of the reasons in the past were, were being said that this is a scaling solution. Um, if you looked at Lane's talk yesterday, Um, but it really fits in with a lot of the research 
or a lot of other scaling solutions. Um, one of the, the really good benefits is it, we can avoid a lot of hard forks here, frankly. There's a lot of hard forks in introducing pre compiles or like subsidized features you would really want to get in the system, but you cannot do that in UVM. Um, and because you can implement a lot of those things in WebAssembly itself, you don't need hard forks. Um, and that means development can be really this today. Um, it has much more uh, languages supported for WebAssembly, those we have discussed so many times already. Um, this other really interesting point is that currently with EVM, uh, we need to design the instruction set and we need to design and write all of the implementations. So that means the Goetrium developers have to write all of this, uh, the C++ people have to write all of this, <coughs> the people at Parity have to write all of this, and there are like three or four new clients who are being developed and everybody has to write all of this. But if you're relying on WebAssembly, you don't need to do that because a lot of other people are doing that for us. <laughs> yeah, we had we had a hard time like today with this project and this one of the one of the, the building blocks of the of the system. Um, <laughs> basically two reasons to use this EVM to WASM tool. So what this EVM to WASM tool can do is you feed it EVM bytecode and it gives you EWASM bytecode and you can run it directly in EWASM. Um, it can be used to run run old contracts on a pure EWASM client. And the way we're using it right now is to use the, the current Ethereum test suite uh, with EWASM because we can just take whatever is there and run it directly. But one interesting use case would be if, if in the future there would be a light client which would want to be compatible with the current Ethereum system, they could just use a mobile uh, web browser and uh, use this tool to run all the contracts in the browser without implementing UPM directly. So where are we now? <laughs> <laughs> OK, probably still here, right? Yeah. So that, this is this is the end goal, to have a public test net. Um, but one thing which is not mentioned there is it's kind of unclear yet, and this is probably going to be the main question hopefully you guys can ask, but it's unclear yet how this is going to be deployed. In the past, it was planned to be deployed on main chain, um, but now it seems a bit more realistic that it's going to be part of a sharding solution. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's, that's all we have, right? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Overview. yeah I, think, I think it was too long already. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm just kind of curious, having watched the presentation from UPC from Parity on their work on WASM and knowing a little bit about the work on WASM and from across the projects, or are they like pretty similar? Um, like a historical overview is that the WASM was the first prototype uh, of which Definities. So what Definity is using is called Premium, uh, and that's one of the evolutionary steps from EWASM. Um, so it, it originated from the very same project. Um, and what EWASM at that step tried to accomplish is to be fully EVM compatible, so you could have EWASM and EVM on the same client, on the same network. Um, and it's designed with, with those restrictions in mind. But if you can get some of those restrictions, you can design a very different system. Uh, and one such design is Crimea, which is implemented today. And parallel to that, I think some point later, Parity started to work on PWASM. Um, I'm not sure about the, the design goals, but I think some parts might be a bit different. Uh, however, we are working together with them on aspects, and we would like to get all these systems closer together um, because it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense right now if you have three or four competing systems at the same time. Um, one thing I can say is uh, this metering uh, we have talked about, like the, the, the metering, um, metering of web assembly, that process seems to be shared across all three solutions. Um, but we plan to, to share more things uh, as much as possible. Yeah, when we met with them, at, well, we met with one of the developers at FCC, and it seemed like yeah, we were all making pretty much the same like research floating point operations because that's not. Super useful on the blockchain. 
contracts at least for one thing, but then uh, the same major decisions as well. So. so do you guys, instead of me just standing here, should we be like a panel and uh, face questions or? I don't know. Very interesting. <laughs> you comment more, I want to hear more about your thoughts on closed point operations. So you don't. Is it an issue, or I mean, I feel like at some point we're going to want closed point operations. Well, I don't know. I guess there's some some questions about the determinism of floating point operations, especially on different hardware. Like even the IEEE spec of floating point operations leaves some non-determinism in there. And I think that's basically what the web assembly spec falls back to in a lot of cases. So we just decided not to deal with that mess and just throw it out. So it's not like we we didn't. I mean. Basically, your contract will be rejected at deploy time if it uses deploy point operations. And all three of the groups that are using WebAssembly, so our group and then the Paris group and Ethinity as well, made the same choice. So, in a sense, if you ever wanted to use floating point operations, and my argument is not necessarily that they should exist at the maybe at the lowest level of implementation, but logically the things that you're doing are real value, and you have to operate to prove a floating point, even if you later end up applying like that, you have to find a way to do this without ever using floating point operations unless your yeah, guess, level language handles it. Yeah, I guess you could implement your own fixed point, yeah. you know, a resonant library or something like that. But I'm already running into a little bit. There is a place where I have to deal with ratios where I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, have to say imply that I want to operate with so many decimals and use some rough, right. like approximate. I mean, it's, it's deterministic because it's yeah. like, hey, I'm passing a number of decimals on it. Doing some operations which are going to effectively implement floating point in the intermediate. The issue is that they resolve right. to a, a, basically use ratios and you get the effective behavior yeah. of floating point operation, and then it's still just done using all of the, the yeah. integer operations. But it seems to me that. Yeah, but mostly continuous math or that I've seen put in the smart contracts. I mean, and mostly I've just worked with uh, some of the guys writing like MakerDAO stuff and things with that. For the die stuff, but the basically you just do some math. Okay, our only you accumulate to you know, this amount or something. You put some error bounds on how much you're going to do approximations of it. <laughs> I see, and my, then, my, my ask is more because like I see us moving in a direction where we need actually more and more continu continuous valued math. But I do 100% agree that it has to be implemented in such a way that you know at the at the, the level that you guys are dealing with, you're not actually doing floating point math. You have to resolve. At the higher level of abstraction, yeah. how to get it back into something that's effectively integer, but you're moving through floating point in the course of your code. And how do you, if that means. Well, that, uh, well, I don't know. The stuff we did, we never moved through floating point. We just went straight from reals to integers, and then we did some some extra proofs just by hand that, you know, the error bounds never, never some amount or something, as long as you save small enough values or something like that. Right? Yeah, so, that makes sense. But, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it, it, I guess it's kind of an open question. Like, do we want floating point operations on blockchains? I would argue no. Like, maybe, maybe some restricted subset of them that behave really well or something like that. I mean, they're not behaving nice like integers. They're not behaving like an actual group or anything like that. They're just like understood. You know, I think maybe then I'm asking is, do you think it makes sense to have libraries for things at the level above that don't actually compile into floating point operations, but that actually allow you to chain. But uh, as we just discussed, sort of floating point operations are not really deterministic in the, the wild spec, and yet. So accurately. So I don't know if they've found a solution to this yet, but maybe they will. It so it's one, I'm sorry. Just one thing, uh, one actual example, and it was in the spec regarding floating points, is they didn't want it to restrict um, the representation of infinity and not number. Yeah, and, and a number can, be, can have arbitrary non zero significance. So uh, it, it can be whatever, and it's, it's still within the spec. So. And actually, the two physical CPU designs, ARM and Intel, operate differently in not the number aspects. Mm -hmm. Something that's like, not to speak about a border execution. Uh, uh, modern CPUs can do the multiplications and things out of order, and the result's different. Right. Yeah, and I think my interest is mostly at the higher levels of abstraction, whether or not you can develop things that have what is effectively real value mathematics that resolve in a way that is consistent by essentially maybe 
proprietary themselves feel like you're operating floating points, but that they have to compile them to something that would be resolved by an MPA integer map and appropriate ratio. Yeah, so once we WebAssembly, we can compile any map library into yeah. WebAssembly and just use that there. <coughs> like a big floating, I don't know what it's called, but like arbitrary, uh, big, a big number line, right? Yeah, so usually so that's that's cool. Cool. But you just said it would fail if I ended up trying to use those. I mean, WebAssembly would be an hour and have more things. No, but those, those things they implement everything uh, with with basic data structures. Usually, with memory data structures, like big number libraries, they don't. Yeah, usually so use. if you if you call like the F32 dot add operation in your web in your EWASM contract, then it will be rejected at deploy time. That's just a decision that right. the groups have made. So I think he's talking more about yeah, almost the same thing we're talking about, just some high level library that does the compilation for you. You could imagine building into a compiler where you have like. In the facility level, to keeping. Which is essentially the hack around that we're doing right. anyway by essentially throwing in, uh, a, a pa passing through a method, something that's just called decimals, and then it right. gives you a, an integer with it says well, a bunch of zeros, so that when you go to do your safe math, you're actually operating and able to get a ratio to so many decimals, even though. You're actually still looking at an integer, and so I guess maybe I'm as I think through what you guys are doing, it just makes sense that that has to live a level above, and that it's proper. You're gonna have to give more instructions for it to be properly compiled into something that won't get rejected. Yeah. So I think like the current um, the high level languages, contract languages, uh, which are in Ethereum, uh, both are moving in the direction to get fixed points only um, next to integers. So Viper has. A single fixed point type, uh, which so far was called decimal 10, um, but it has been changed uh, or will be changed soon. And Solidity has our flexible fixed point type system, which is not released yet. Um, but basically, we have two parameters for, for the fixed point types. So you have the total uh, bit width, so like the total size, um, and then you can specify the uh, number of decimal digits. Because I think one of the directions we're going in, and I guess maybe this is biased for itself, but like towards more general analytical, like like we can write contracts that have sort of state dependence in them, and we can accomplish more interesting things in our economic systems that we're coding in blockchain environments by employing analytical logic. But if it, we don't actually resolve the intermediate steps to actually compute it in the sort of blockchain environment, then it doesn't help us to design sort of systems that have this sort of mathematical logic embedded in them. But that generally assumes when you do those abstractions that you know you're gonna have some lower level like bounds like he was talking about is totally fine. It's just you it's abstraction layer the place where it gets resolved before you get to the point where it gets run away. I guess you can conclude yeah. um, so to conclude the this side effect uh, in the day to just reject contracts which use floating point of assembly, um, even though many of the some of the issues could be circumvented by by inserting like extra runtime checks. Um, but it seems like there's no need for having floating point support in a contract because you can implement most of this on a higher level anyway with fixed points. Um, I wanted to ask about the subsidy uh, for like the at the moment. I'm not sure. Um, we come out, we have right now and using EVM operations. Is that still going to be so in, the, in an EWASM uh, environment? Or should we expect like the shaft 3 function to cost the same if I code it by hand or if I use a precompile in, in EVM in the EVM virtual machine, whatever it is? So we don't have the um, we don't have final answer to this yet, um, but we did. Um, a while ago, we did a benchmark of SHA-256 so in WebAssembly versus so the pre compile And on, on certain sizes, it was comparable or cheaper. Um, but I think on smaller uh, sizes, it may have been more expensive. Um, I have no idea about SHA-3. Very likely, it's, it would be more expensive uh, because SHA-3 is even more subsidized by not having to pay for the call, uh, which is 700. Um, I think it would be unlikely to, to get to the same cost. Um, it's probably to tell. 
but the idea would be to remove the special operations, move on to something where everything. Yeah, chat tree will be removed, so the pre-compiles don't necessarily have to be removed because they're already present in the network and the uh, in the system. Uh, so they would be still there the same way they are. And uh, what improvement one could make is to not have them written in each of the clients with the languages that the clients are written in, whether you could have it written once in web assembly to be used by other clients. Right. And more in general, how would this all affect the current gas prices? Uh, are you expecting that they would change in some way? Um, so in general, there is a document in design repo regarding uh, what is called uh, determining gas costs or yeah. something like that. Um, and then one of it lists like three different goals how the, the gas costs should be calculated. But one of the goals is to say one second of execution time should equal to 10, 10 million gas. And <clears throat> we look certain CPUs, um, what kind of execution time certain instructions take. And since all of these, if you divide by like the, the 10 million gas should be one second, if you calculate uh, like how many nanoseconds or yeah, I guess it would be nine seconds. How many seconds certain instructions would take? It would be a fraction of the gas. Um, so rather of having fractions of the gas, we just call it a particle, uh, which is the smallest unit. Um, but it's really hard to tell how much uh, it's going to cost. Uh, in this design, it's compatible, so you can have your, your EVM gas cost, and you can have this wasn't gas cost uh, in particles, but at the, the higher level, it's just the uh, That's not very horrible. We're only working on the EWAS and gas as well. So. Uh, so yeah. Operation break. Oh, okay. And we'll try to you know, take inspiration from you. Okay. So one other thing to mention there is, uh, so even though we looked at certain CPUs and how much physical time each instruction is going to take, uh, the way this uh, verification slash metering contract is designed that it's upgradable, it's, it's a contract itself. Uh, so, with consensus, all of these gas costs can be changed easily. So, it's not like this. Uh, and since all of the gas costs are in a contract itself, you don't need to change every single client in order to change the gas costs, which is the case today. You just need to have consensus on the single contract. Uh, so, it should be much easier to follow, uh, you know, like uh, execution time changes on clients and uh, just. Uh, and that's what's important. Anyone asking questions? But so, like, uh, it sounds like there's a contract which is in an EWAS interpreter. Uh, there's a contract that is an EWAS contract that will, it's not written yet, we're in the process of still ironing out the details, but it is your EWAS code will be run through this EWAS contract, which will inject the metering statements. Um, which is where the gas cost comes in, and also do the validity checks. There's the standard laws and validity checks, plus our extra ones like, you know, both loading point operations and stuff like that. Um, and so what Alex was saying is, now we just have to have the network agree on that one WASM contract, similar to how how Casper is being developed. How there's like a Casper, there's the Casper contracts basically, and we have to agree on what the Casper contracts are, and they handle all of the the uh, proof of stake stuff that's going to happen. So similar sort of idea there where, you know, now we have direct, you know, instead of having a text proposal in terms of like, you know, I want this EIP to get through, you can just submit a proposal for a change to the contract itself. And none of the change stuff where you can execute EWAS and code at that point. But even if you change the gas cost of certain version, you wouldn't change it for contracts that have been previously checked with the statement of the old version of the contract, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't need to update the, the gas costs for. Yeah, okay. that, that's a really good question. This is one of the design decisions we're still um, mm -hmm. discussing. Um, but one option is that uh, this um, so this contract which does the verification and deploy time is called the Sentinel contract. So one option is that the Sentinel contract at deploy time inserts the metering statements, and then the costs are fixed. Uh, and that means in the future, if costs would be cheaper, then you wouldn't get it down to the contract. But if the price become more expensive, you would still get it cheaper. Um, 
So this has its pros and cons. And another option is to not insert those, those metering, metering statements at deploy time, rather insert them before execution. And then there are different options to how to cache them, um, because you would lose a lot if, if you do it every single time. Yeah. Um, but that, that's one of the bigger questions we are still discussing. And actually, this single question is not, um, as mentioned before, we are in, in contact with other teams working on web semi in the blockchain context. So this is one of the generic questions which is to be discussed across all of those things. Um, but anybody who wants to um, you know, be more involved in these decisions, uh, please just join uh, on this channel on Gitter. Um, and their slash design is a design repo to, to find all of these discussions. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. Also, we've started doing bi-weekly calls. Is it bi-weekly? Yeah, oh, when we remember. Oh, when was the next one? Probably this should be. Oh, I guess it was yesterday. Oh, <laughs> 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 maybe it's next, next week. Anyway, we have like a, a good three weeks ish. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, we have an open uh, public call, which is advertised on this channel. Um, like two, two weeks ahead, right? And, and there's, a, there's a repo where agenda points can be put. Uh, people haven't done that so far. Um, but we usually have one hour, uh, people can join. Uh, usually, a lot of people joining. And, you know, like this, random questions can be asked. And we're happy to have anyone and any kind of questions. We tried to do a demo <laughs> at FCC, and, and there was like one flag missing. From the Let me, I mean, how much time are we slated for? It doesn't, it's okay. Fast. 8 p.m. was the time for the beers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard it. Oh, there's some. Oh, we forgot to tell you. Yeah, dinner starts at 8 p.m. Um, yeah, it's like 8 so I think since uh, all of you are involved with the contract development, do you have any pain points you see currently with EPM, which may or may not be addressed by any of these points? What are the, the main issues you, you face today? Error messages, but I think that's. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. Cool. Well, you can use KDM as the bar. I wonder if debugging would be better in that sense. Well, it's just going to be more tooling support in general. Yeah. I mean, there already are like online little things that will let you step through execution. Yeah, it probably would be a good idea also to cover to look more into that. Yeah. Is that, that would be one of the benefits, right? To get better debugging. Well, right now, well, at least what I know is Remix. Uh, and the chocolate the bugger I don't know if there's any you need to set up around your to bootstrap to your project, let's say. High level that the pain points are. Yeah, but this also solves. Getting back to the bugging, even writing the bugging, a the debugger for interacting an already written debugger in for the EBM, it would be kind of a pain because the EBM is quite strange, right? Yeah. So, what I would love to have is an IDE which lets you debug a both your test and the current and the contracts at the same time. But I looked at it and it's kind of complicated because the EVM is then what? What? What was the last thing you said? That integrating the EVM 
what it's been through. Yeah. That's part of the point of the, the cave. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, well, I work for also runtime verification, and they do a lot of work on K framework. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen K, but just like you define your language once in K, and then you get a bunch of tools out of it, and one of the tools is a debugger. But it's a kind of low level debugger, like you can, you can step through each execution step, but your execution step is like, okay, deduct the gaps, okay. You know, calculate what the change on the storage will be. Okay, apply the change on the storage. It's not like one op code at a time, it's like one K execution step at a time. So it's more used by the K devs for debugging the actual K definition to see like why or passing it or something like that. Um, but we are integrating, well, we, we just recently got Remix to talk to KVM and also to talk to KDLA, which is another block, another VM that Runtime Verification is working on um, for the Cardano. Um, blockchain. Um, and so I guess maybe we'll be doing some work on trying to improve Remix. But you know, I don't know. I don't know how to solve these sorts of tooling issues because I don't like I don't use them very much. I like operate at a different level. Um, like a little like more just directly with the EVM and less with contract writing and stuff. So this is what we need to learn from you guys, right? I'm not writing contracts either, we're just writing a virtual machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do you have like issues with Like, I did, like, there's some like, a certain like, 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 Right, so you can call that contract adapter shot data. No, I was just wondering if you had thought about the kind of shot. Um, there's actually a, an interesting tidbit here. Because shot is so cheap, and memory operations aren't that cheap. Um, I'm not sure if you know about the like the solidity string is also one of the major string libraries used by people. Comparing like for quality or, or you know, comparing strings, yeah. it's not done by our operations, it's done by Shantree. Yeah. That's the cheapest one. <laughs> and um, it doesn't really make sense, right? And that wouldn't be a case in Boston because memory operations are very cheap. Uh, so you, you know, with, with Wasm, some things may, may change, and if your tool isn't prepared for it, it may, may be much more expensive, um, but it could be made uh, cheaper. By, by just yeah, it. so string conversion would be very much cheaper because you're not actually hashing the string, you just break it. Hey, go ahead. Oh, uh, so just kind of curious, how do you, so today when you like invoke the three compiles, these are just things that are available to you in the solidity language, so you can just like call them directly. Uh, but in like this future where the pre, what would be a pre compile today, it might be implemented as a Watson contract in the future. How do you imagine the interaction for developers to be? As in, like, is it embedded in the language itself so that like you can basically just be like call this SHA3 contract that you can do directly? Or do you expect developers to basically know that, oh, this SHA3 contract lives at this address and I have to somehow use specific tooling to help me realize that it lives at this address with the shared library? Well, in the compiler. Have to burden the, I mean, I'm not saying the compiler can do that now. I'm just saying, like, you could codify that in the compiler and you could say, like, put Sol C in Zeppelin mode where it's using Zeppelin's libraries or put it in, you know, whatever other. Actually, I can talk from a solidity's perspective in the sense that the language in the compiler tries to, to be more slim than it was before and not to do all of this magically. And there are two, there are a couple of complementary projects, and one of them is the ETPM. Ethereum package manager. Um, if are you familiar with um, JavaScript, uh, like the Node ecosystem, yeah. NPM <clears throat> and packages, it's the same thing for contracts. Um, so I hope that in the future we're going to have all of this like frameworks and ecosystem much more expanded, and we're going to have all these packages. And uh, are you familiar with the library um, libraries in Solidity? Mm -hmm. um, so like the, this um, EPM. The next EPM would be to have libraries 
as packages. Uh, and you can, in your framework of choice, uh, you can refer to different hybrid versions, and the, the entire framework going to do the linking for you. Um, so what you're going to see in your contract is you have a single statement using whatever chat tree library, and then you just use chat tree library dot whatever chat tree. Uh, it could be transparent for you, um, but all these the package manager going to do everything else. Okay. Who wants to ask a question? Have any questions from anyone on our live stream? <laughs> I think it's Casey and Holger and two unknowns. <laughs> Maybe. Couldn't go over our goals for this sprint, but you uh, so you were someone mentioned Jared doing the demo. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> the last time the demo code up was updated was three months ago. So I'm uh, piecing that together. Uh, we might have to do that another day because it looks like a few flags may have changed in CPP Ethereum since since then. Okay. The rest of we yeah. always just do a PowerPoint slides. <laughs> when, are you, when do you think that's going to be like um, live? And what specifically? Oh, a test net? Test net. Yeah. It's a, it's a, so for next week. Yeah, so a test net, we're <laughs> optimistically shooting for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so in transparency, this maybe. Was what we were originally shooting Maybe for. something we can ask for feedback on, right? Like we 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 have a, as our first deliverable this test net, and like we we've already spun up a test net. It's just that you know all the code behind the test net is still a work in progress. So like, how mature does the test net need to be? We can have a test net tomorrow, but it's going to be limited in what it can do. But when you yeah, say we well, can have a test right, net tomorrow, what you right. mean is we can have a test net tomorrow where if you submit uh, if you submit a piece of code that causes a bug, it will crash the test. Entire so yeah, we can have a test net tomorrow, which really embodies the test part of the test net. We we, we needed Greg Colvin safe test net. I would well, say I would say probably put a test net up and then just let people. That's test net. Colvin, you going to create your own test net? Yeah. We we need to go to Stockholm for. Uh, to, yeah, to find a train stop. It's gonna, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a new one. The main reason is because so far we've only built this on CPP Ethereum, and the other test that don't support CPP Ethereum. Hopefully soon we'll have guest support because we're working on um, adding Watson support to get as well. So even once you fire up the testnet, what all tool do you choose? Work with the right I have. I guess the more interesting question though, what would you expect from the testing? Yeah. Like for example, on Block Explorer, how important is that? What does it need what does it need to have? No, I, I didn't mention really no, but in general, what would you what would you do if there would be a testing? What would you want to do? Um, what kind of tooling would you need for that? Oh. Since right now I'm working with Solidity, I just, I would expect the Solidity to he was some compiler, which mm -hmm. I don't know how advanced that is. I don't know if that really works. Or it's working for hours, so. It's working in progress, but they're probably going to take uh, longer than the test time. Right. Like launching the test. So, okay. so if I could chime in, actually what's pretty cool is that because uh, LVM has a WASM backend, you can compile any language that uh, LVM has a front end for to WASM. So I mean, unfortunately, yeah, I can't build it. Access the EDI. Yeah, let's do that way. So are you excited to write contracts in C? <laughs> well, I was gonna say. We, so for the demo, which unfortunately I just don't have the time to get working right now. Um, but what I did, <laughs> it it works. Trust me. Um, <laughs> that's what you said, to Paris. Uh, but actually, what I did was took the existing um, code. There's an EIP. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but to, and to add the Blake to the Blake to hash function to Ethereum. And what I did was take an existing the existing reference implementation of that, compile it to Wasm, and throw it on the chain, and then interact with that contract. Right. So that doesn't answer question around yeah. tooling, but you can. 
So, yeah. so you wanted to write a smart contract in Rust. I know you mm -hmm. can use LDM to target or something using Rust, but what about writing to it using storage? Yeah, we're that's that's a work in progress right. at this point. Um, so I know you were working on some kind of shim API for that, but if not, <laughs> maybe that was something else. Wait, uh, hold on, where are we talking about? Like, in like five seconds, just like writing to storage from uh, Rust. Oh, oh, like, oh yeah, I was working on like a header library for just writing to the Amazon contact, essentially. Which is true, but there is something which is similar to JavaScript, TypeScript, and this compiler from TypeScript to that's But we plan to have some of these um, example, like example contracts in each of these languages. But re realistically, what, what can be done in a testnet is it still will be able to run EVM. So you can compile solid APS to do today and you can use it. Uh, you don't really get too many benefits. But if you have some code which requires which can be written in solidity in the first place or requires a lot of gas in EVM, you could try to write it in Rust, which seems like a good idea, better than C. Rust um, results in better WASM binaries than anything else at this point, right? No, C is the well, same, yes, same yes, but C wouldn't be really something suggested to write contracts. Uh, you can put the heavy, heavier parts of the contract in Rust and interact with that. In parentheses, uh, when you talk about like, the intrinsics that you need to and run the storage, etc. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah so, so the WASM spec already has a place in it for uh, describing how to interact with what are called host functions. And basically, they're just uh, the, the embedder is what it's called. So like, you know, Firefox WebAssembly engine or whatever run WebAssembly uh, has to provide essentially, you know, type signatures for these for these functions that the, the contract or the, the WebAssembly code then, can then call out to. So the EWASM will basically just be a WebAssembly engine that has been instantiated with a set of imported functions with type signatures corresponding to like sstore, sload, these sorts of things. So they go out to the embedder, the embedder does the correct update in the client, and then comes back to the end and continues execution. Um, memory operations aren't uh, that kind of uh, which, right? Which ones? Like mload, mstore. Well, there won't be, well, mload and m, uh, so I mean, the, the, me the, me yeah, right. the memory layout is also just different in, in WebAssembly. Like it's, I mean, slightly different, but there is an analogous thing for mload and mstore. And I suppose, like exiting from opcode operation to like the e EI thing uh, for its performance. Um, I was wondering if like, the style of that you usually write for smart contracts ends up uh, affecting performance too much. I like if, if, if every opcode was followed by a, an S score, I suppose that would negate. But that would hurt your, I mean, even in EVM, that would hurt your performance, right? The reason S store is charged for is because you do have to interact with the client. It has to look in its storage, find that account storage, and actually look up those values, right? So clients kind of opportunistically try to load as little of the state as they need for contract execution already. Okay. So I don't know. I just I think it's also a problem with EVM. I mean, I don't see it as a problem. I think it's just like part of life here. Because anytime you do an F store, you know, you're requiring that now all the nodes on the network store that data moving forward. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it should be expensive. Um, yeah, that's that's my take on it. And speaking of S store, um, would it would it also have dif different gas costs for writing to zero, uh, changing from zero to one zero, and then back? We're trying to make gas tokens stop working. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know the specifics on that, but we we I think that is. Uh, I think that's grounds for to be to be decided. Yeah. I mean, our metering can take that and to just make that. Well, yeah, but what I mean is that's more of a discussion around things like rent, which is a parallel like, debate. Well, I don't think it's very relevant. So, like, for example, right now, um, like over the past few days, we actually were looking at not S store, but call 
and trying to you know debate whether or not the call spec can be made cleaner by changing around some of the gas modifications. So, um, yeah, so we're so we're, so we're looking at ways to you know maybe change that from the original EBM uh, in a way that would uh, result in a cleaner spec and uh, way forward behavior. But it, yeah, I mean the problem is it's, it's in development. It's yeah. up in the air. The problem is that these rules for gas calculator and there's cost tax, mm -hmm. but they weren't like they weren't planned ahead of time, right? So it was you know you, you had EBM and then they realized there was an attack and they bolted on something to fix it, right? So it'd be nice now that we have this opportunity to go back and try to untangle some of that and still have prevention of the DOS stuff, but maybe make it a little more straightforward how the calculations happen. So um, yeah, not really sure, but probably what we'll do is model it all off of EDM initially um, and then work to simplify it. Um, I, I think I might have just missed the details of this, but from a migration point of view, you guys talked a little bit about EDM, the EDM to Wellcome tool. Um, so when, like, let's say Ethereum or Forks and migrates to a lot of architecture, is the expectation that like all these groups are running some type of EDM to Wasm tool? And then that when like a lot of new laws and contracts interact with like a whole contract address that represents EDM code, they run that tool to convert it to laws and to run it then? Or are you does do every node does every node have the network have to convert every EDM by code contract into a laws and contract? Let me actually look into that and all of them have pros and cons. It's something unclear at this point that this is gonna be a hard fork in the main chain mm -hmm. to introduce WASM. Right. But if there would be one and the more likely scenario would be to keep EVM contracts as they, as they were, not change them at all. Uh, and then clients would have two options. I uh, just use the native EVM implementation, or they could use EVM to Wasm. But since the clients already have the native EVM implementation, unlikely they're going to remove it. But they would have the option to remove it. Um, but that being said, it's unclear whether this is going to be introduced uh, on a hard fork on the main chain. Um, a tiny bit uh, more realistic seems to be uh, introducing it through sharding. Right. Right. And if it's launched in a shard, then shards start empty, so there is no idea of legacy not to worry about. Yeah, and we, we have a lot more freedom than to. We don't have to maintain all the EVM semantics, basically. Yeah. I'm guessing, like, if they choose to discard the native EVM and they're still supporting old EVM contracts, um, there would probably be a performance hit if they had to like convert the EVM contract into like the one architecture to run it. Yeah, it's convert the loop each iteration of the loop, you only convert the whole thing once, right? So it's an upfront cost, and then you know when you execute it, you'll win back some of that time before you're executing the line. At least that's the idea. I think there's there's slim data supporting that, but I don't. I mean, we won't know until we have more. Until we have a test net, then we collect more data. <laughs> But the testnet uh, is going to be one which has both EPM and WASM, yeah. and you and uh, it supports deployment of both and interaction between both. Um, but the testnet may not. I mean, it's it, it will be like an evolving testnet probably um, with different revisions. Um, and as we get closer to finding out how it wasn't going to be launched uh, as a shard or on the main chain or whoever knows what what kind of options going to be there. Um, but as we get closer to that, the test is going to be updated to, to reflect whatever the decision is. Um, but the initial one been super cool. Anything else, sir? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll cover live stream and we'll just be casual. Thanks to everyone who listened. Bye. Thank you for all the great questions. We're going to kick off the super secret meeting now. Oh, crap. Is the stream still on? The Ethereum management. <laughs>